I want to talk to you about Indigo Agriculture, their carbon farming program. What is the dent you expect this or hope uh, this will make in the climate fight? Emily, thanks for having me. This is a very exciting day today because it's really the first time that a certified carbon credit has been issued against uh, uh, basically output from farmers. And while today we announced 20,000 tons of, of, of certified carbon uh, being captured, uh, that really can scale and can scale rapidly, we think. Uh, and so it really is a proof point. Um, there's there's probably several orders of magnitude, 100, 1,000 fold more that can be expected from this. And I think that agriculture is kind of a, a, a very interesting way to think about uh, carb storing, capturing and storing carbon and uh, creating returns for farmers, which is also a very important uh, uh, kind of part of the circular economy aspect of this. So we're bracing for yet another Supreme Court ruling, this one on whether the EPA has the authority to tell companies to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. What are you bracing for here? And how could this impact your new venture? Well, I mean, certainly I think that, that, that we see a lot of mixed signals as when it comes to how consistently we want to, 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 to make sure that corporations and, and other entities are being responsible for their carbon footprint. Certainly the, the, the momentum has been in favor of more and more responsibility, but I think that regulation aside, the vast majority of companies are moving down a path where they're taking it upon themselves. Today's announcement by Indigo involves 11 major brands that actually have stepped up and, and, and associated with the work that the farmers do, some $40 per ton of carbon, uh, which is twice what it was a year ago. And we think that these incentives that, that will drive the creation of these credits will be part of the solution. And I think corporations might be forced to do it, but they also may choose to do it because it's the right thing to do and it's scalable. Now, uh, regulatory advisors just recommended that shots from Moderna and Pfizer be updated to target Omicron. What are the next steps for Moderna here? And how will your concoction be different than what Pfizer has to offer? Well, the context switch is pretty sudden, but I think it's, it's memorable for me, Emily, because at some level, we're talking about the health of the planet, and then we're also talking about the health of the inhabitants of the planet. So for us, it's really all the same thing from a point of view of the science and the innovation. Uh, specifically to your, to your question, clearly we've been caught up in this battle for two years now between a virus and the, the, the tech, human technology to combat it. And as the virus adapts, we've had to adapt our own uh, vaccine to be able to stay ahead of it and provide the kind of immune protection. We showed at yesterday's hearing with the FDA that the data we're generating out of a bivalent, that is two different spike protein sequences in our new vaccines, uh, are a robust protection package for what we expect to be uh, what's coming up in the fall. So what we need to do is to work with the authorities, making sure that we, we kind of uh, uh, put in place the, what will be the, the next vaccine that's going to be used. Uh, certainly yesterday's vote encouraged Omicron to be incorporated into that. And once that's done, we're ready to ramp up production and be ready by early fall to provide the vaccines needed for protection. I think a lot of people, as you know, Emily, are tired. I'm tired. Everybody's tired of this of this pandemic. But the, the bad news is the virus doesn't get tired. And we're going to have to stay vigilant, however tired we get. We, we are tired. I agree. And also, you know, there are a lot of folks waiting on these boosters and guidance on boosters. It's, it's, it's been kind of confusing, the messaging from the U.S. government. You said early fall. Is that the soonest? You, like, like, when do you think Omicron-specific shots will be going into the arms of Americans? Pending working out with the FDA and other authorities the final uh, vaccine composition that we're going with. And there's a little bit of this that begins to look like early versions of what we've done with seasonal flu, where there's got to be a, a definition set on what the next vaccine looks like. But once that's done, we think the sooner that's done, the sooner we can get on. We're poised to manufacture uh, significant quantities. And, and like we're looking at as early in the fall as we can. You know, early September would be great, may well be, depending on when the go-ahead is given, uh, that will affect it. But, but we certainly have 
planned for and are poised to be able to move very, very quickly. Now, COVID vaccines are starting to roll out for kids, and I'm curious how you think that campaign is going. We've seen a kind of a slow uh, vaccination campaign under, under pediatricians. What's it going to take to make parents less hesitant to get this done? Look, I think that it, it took a while to get to this point, which is unfortunate because during that time, people were exposed to any, any number of conflicting points of view, and, and everybody... Uh, 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 seems to have a view about any number of topics that relate to public health, even though there's public health professionals that I'd say are probably much more uh, uh, prepared to and, and qualified to, to guide what it is we're doing as a population. I think it's going to take a little bit of time for people to get the right information. The fact is rigorous testing has been done. The fact is that protecting the youngest kids from getting infected is not only important for their health, but the health of the people surrounding them and the people who want to be with them. And so I think that overall, just like we're vaccinated for, for lots of other things, uh, we care about our kids' health, and this is a very important next step. The other thing you have to keep in mind, Emily, and again, this is, I think, getting lost in the information wars that seem to be going on, is that actually just getting COVID, let alone getting it over and over again, is from a long-term health standpoint, dangerous. And, right. and, and I think that we think of this as a cold, and we go, well, we get it every year, so big deal. There's no evidence that the way this disease plays out, uh, quite the contrary. There's evidence that in some subset of people, several percent of the people, it has long-term effects. And I don't see that that's going to be different once enough young kids get this. So we have to be uh, less cavalier about it and do everything we can to prevent it, at least until we learn more about the disease. We just got a new headline that Pfizer and BioNTech are going to get an extra $3.2 billion from the United States for COVID vaccine development. Are you expecting more money for Moderna as well? I can't comment on that. All right. So let's talk about the national biodefense strategy. I'm so curious if you and Flagship have spoken to the Biden administration about this and what the role of Flagship could be there. You know, obviously the hope is that at some point this pandemic abates, but we will be facing other threats. So, Emily, we, we have indirect contacts uh, or through a number of channels, and I'd say that I'm happy to see more discussion happening about this whole notion of health security. This is something that we've talked about for three years. In fact, preceding the pandemic, we do think that we need to elevate our health to a matter of security, not just care. It's not enough that our health kind of is under attack, and then we try to then do something about it, we have to get ahead of it. And health security, whether it's against pathogen threats uh, or against a lot of the slow pandemics that we are attacked by every day, whether that's cancer or Alzheimer's or obesity or any number of diseases, all of these are the same kind of threat that can take down our lives, take down our health, and we need to get ahead of it. Health security, biodefense, all of that is part of a comprehensive solution. And I certainly hope and expect that the kind of damage this pandemic has done will be at least converted into some long-term uh, lasting value to society, just like major wars have led to significant kind of after effects that have been good for mankind. I expect that to be the case in this case through a more serious effort at preparedness and prevention.